All right, guys, it is a snow day here in Denver, which means it is drunk YouTube day. I've been on Irish cream and coffee since I woke up this morning, basically. Um, also been taking dabs, so bear with me. All right, uh, I'm doing a bunch of videos today. The first one is on next level side chaining. Uh, so this is mostly for kind of more creative type side chaining. I mean, if you're just trying to get the job done, there's other methods that work just as well or almost as well. Uh, this one will work better in my opinion than all of them. Uh, which includes using things like Duck or LFO tool or shaper box. Uh, it definitely works better than just side chaining directly to the audio track. It works better than side chaining to a click track. If you've heard uh, some of the pros talk about that, where they have like the kick MIDI sent to a track that plays a little click, and then the side chain compressors listen to that click, and then you can control the release time on it to sort of dial in the slope. Um, so this will work better than that too. Uh, so just have a listen really quick. Um, so you might be wondering what this thing down here is. This is just an oscilloscope. If you zoom in, um, you'll see the actual waves. And what I've done is with these envelopes, I have drawn in these shapes. And now you'll also notice, well, this doesn't look like a shape you can draw in an envelope. Um, I've also done things like, in this case, done modulation on the gain of this envelope uh, to chop it up into this kind of barbed arrow shape you see. Uh, but generally, all these things are these clips here are different values for the attack, decay, sustain, and release, and the curvature of these lines. And what this is, is this is the envelope for a high frequency square wave, right? Now, the reason I'm using a high frequency square wave in sampler right now is because um, square waves are always at full scale, right? And the higher the frequency, the faster it starts up and stops, right? And um, the reason I do this is so that the compressors that are side chained to this will react as fast as possible. So if I want to do the click method that uh, other pros would use, they just stick a click in here instead of a square, right? And they would have something like this. Right, and these clicks are extremely short. Right, if we zoom in, you can see that they're um, they're not as short as I could make them because if you get too short, then sometimes the compressors don't even react nicely. Uh, so I can get shorter, but these this clicks about a millisecond long or so, um, and then this is the shortest a click could get, uh, which is even shorter. It's like literally like one full wave basically. Um, so anyway. Uh, so you could do this click method, but instead I'm doing these square waves, which I can put in any shape at all, right? And the reason I would do this is because uh, then you can, much like ShaperBox and LFO tool and things like that, carve out the shape that you want. Um, however, this is an improvement upon those in a number of ways. Now you might notice I just put the track delay 500 milliseconds back. Um, the reason I did that is because uh, I'm at 60 beats per minute and I, every kick drum is happening every 500 milliseconds. So I want to be able to phase this thing back, even in real time, like automate this if I want, but phase back this wave uh, so that I can shift it, right? And that's what this phase knob is. So when this is at 500 milliseconds, uh, the peak of this sampler basically, as long as the tack is zero, um, or the start of this note basically is going to be when the kick drum hits. Uh, so you can set this up in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, they All these are just, like I said, controlling these different shapes by controlling these ADSRs. Um, but some of them start before the kick even hits. Like check out this diamond one. The kick is actually hitting when the diamond is at its peak. And when the diamond is at its peak, the square wave, which is just this high frequency shrill thing, I'm not gonna play it for you, 
Um, but it's at its peak, right? Zero decibels minus zero decibels, if you could see that. Um, and so it's carving away all this space for the kick to hit, and it starts carving away before the kick drum even hits. Now, the reason you'd want to do that is because uh, the, the kickiness, so to speak, of a kick drum comes from what's called speaker thrust. And speaker thrust is when the speaker punches out at you, basically, and it really has to punch from rest. And the reason it's doing that is because if it's just going back and forth, like say you have a subwave that's oscillating back and forth, um, if you then add a kick to that mix, and now your subwaves has just turned into a kick wave or something, maybe you do this side chain compression, you know, but the speakers never stopped oscillating. So even though you think, well, you know, the speaker is thrusting from all the way back, all the way out, what's actually happening is the air waves in the room are already waving as well. And so you're kind of going with the flow and you're not adding a new degree of acceleration, which is really where the, the kick happens when these air particles that were previously at rest all of a sudden get thrust at you as opposed to you're already vibrating with these waves and so you're just kind of jiggling with everything else. You're adding a new jiggle to the mix, so to speak. So it actually helps to carve space out of your mix before your kick drum ever hits so that your song is essentially closer to zero before your kick drum hits and then all of a sudden the speaker thrusts out at you and kicks really hard. Um, so anything that has a pre-transient, whether it's this big long thing, uh, which is slowly cutting out all this song before the kick hits, or it's something tighter like this guy. Right, so you see this little guy, the kick's actually hitting right when this is at its peak. Um, this little pre-transient is starting to suck away the, you know, or carve out space for the kick before the kick ever hits. So that's one of the benefits to doing this is that you can shift like and we can just go from different degrees like this has uh 250 milliseconds of pre-transient this is like 50 this is like 25 right in real time even we can like use follow-on actions and stuff to bounce between these different shapes we can automate these parameters so that we can move these and morph these shapes in real time all without any plugins right uh, and giving you a, a large degree of control right you can make cool custom shapes like check out this cool so you can hear it's giving this whole feathered texture to the mix and what's going on here is um the bigger shapes if you want to think about them that way as we look at this gain knob what this fundamentally is is just a block All right let's check out this one really quick it'll make more sense Right, so we just had this big block of sound that we're basically then automating the gain. So that's what's going on here is we've just automated gain. And so the kick's actually happening at all these big peaks, like here, 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 here. And so I'm making sure to carve out enough space for the kicks, but then the, the whole mix is kind of moving like this. And then I modulate this with this, which is what's causing the feathering. Right, so if I... Right, so it gives you quite a bit of control. You can also apply effects on it, like, um, like stutters, like I was using M Rhythmizer. Um, and there's like a dry signal. There's reasons I routed it like this. I'm not going to go through in this video. Um, but M Rhythmizer would be a good option. Um, but you can also do like Time Shaper and things like that, that or Buffer Shuffler that will like chop and rearrange this. And if you're careful about making sure that your kicks are still carved away or you have a second signal making sure you carve out space for your kick, you can use this to cause the rest of your mix to pump and suck in ways and like shuffle that around so that like these shapes get all like twisted and uh, work different ways or like look different ways. Uh, so there's a lot of creative ways that you can sort of apply towards this because it's an audio signal to mangle this audio signal, right? To then thus mangle the way that 
it is carving out space and causing the rest of the mix to move and breathe. Um, so this is why I think it's better than all the other methods, right? Uh, one, you can use this track delay to get it ahead of the, um, to get it ahead of the game, right? To get it ahead of when the kick hits, so that you can suck out in advance, um, which is hard, to, sort of hard to do in Shaperbox and LFO tool and those sorts of things, right? You can morph these in real time, which you actually can do in Shaperbox. You can automate the, the movements of all the little chits, but it's kind of difficult to do a little bit precisely as opposed to just, oh, I want to change this curvature. I want to change this attack, this decay. It's like you're literally moving these things on an XY plane. It doesn't quite make as much sense musically in certain ways. Uh, it's more flexible in some ways, but uh, it's just not quite as easy. Um, yeah, and this requires no software. Um, the routing's already done for you. So let me show you that really quick. Um, I'm just making sure we've gone through everything. Um, so this is what you would use to actually do the side chain. I've done this mapping and everything. Um, so if these are at zero, then the compressors will turn off. You've got a compressor before and after two compressors. You actually, two compressors is good because they'll react faster and you can, um, kind of set the space that's being carved out more precisely. Um, uh, so th th there's a, a few reasons why you would want to use two side chain compressors that it's, it's useful and you can also set them up differently like with different ratios and attack and release times and stuff um, so that you can then get it to move and breathe differently um, like bend differently and like some of those things like usually you want your attack and release times really fast so it follows the path of this click track but sometimes like having like a really long attack time on these diamond ones for instance can be really nice because you've got like so much time for this stuff carving out of the way before the kick hits that if you have a long attack time even though it's dragging it's still going to carve out plenty of space by the time the kick hits but then you're kind of bending the curvature of this thing just for this group and maybe this guy will be bent a little bit differently and this guy and so they're all sucking and breathing differently right around this same shape in some sort of way that makes sense and you can automate these shapes like go through them on the fly uh, as I said before so to make this work you literally you know you can see this right these guys all over the place these literally I just copied from over here the side chain routing already done for you it's looking at this guy this this rack here not this whole track but this specifically this instrument rack before it gets here but it's grabbing that post effects so it's listening basically right up until this point um, and then you just copy that over and so any effects you want to affect the the signal that is driving the side chain what you need to put inside here but if you do that then it'll it'll impact what's being side chained uh, but you just copy this over you drag the ratios how you want make sure that the dry wets up right otherwise it's not gonna go um, I'm actually going to change this for you um, I had this as filter depth but I, I don't use it because Oh, I actually had already gotten rid of that. Uh, I don't use it because once you're controlling all these things, it's kind of easier to just grab it and have all, all the controls for the side chain auto filter here. Um, definitely use the side chain audio auto filter. Sometimes it sounds much cooler in the breathing and sucking way than, than the, the compressors do. Um, but this is a dry wet for that because there's no dry wet knob on the auto filter. Um, Ableton, if you see this, please put a dry wet knob on your auto filter. All right, but there's not, so I made a dry wet rack, um, you know, and then if this is at zero, it'll also turn off the auto filter for you uh, just to save resources. Same thing with these, these dry wet knobs. So yeah, that's it, guys. Um, go experiment for these. You can build any shapes you want in them. Use both the automation and the modulation. Try running rhythmic effects on this to you know, mess stuff up. Um, play with automating these things right uh which I'll, I'll probably play like this one for you um on the way out but yeah uh definitely use this technique guys um it's it's the way to go i would not use this if you're just specifically side chaining your kick to your sub and i'm going to do a separate video just on that but if you're side chaining your kick to your sub to get your kick and sub to fuse together into one thing i would use um either chain shaper or duck or something for that 
Um, Chain Shaper is a Max for Live device. It's excellent. Um, but we'll talk more about that because that also involves phase coherence and other things that are outside the scope of this video. All right, I love you guys. I'm going to pump out some more of these videos. Um, definitely use this technique. Like I said, it's much more flexible. You can move and twist and shape this thing on the fly. Um, like just do thing like manipulate the curve with audio effects, which you just can't do, uh, you know, with these other things. Um, it doesn't require plugins. You can get super fast response in this, like more control than you can really with these other things. Um, yeah, automation, like of curve bending, all that kind of stuff. So enjoy it. I love you all and take care.